there are various ways. Um, the most popular one, I guess, is a linear la narrative where a story starts at a beginning and gets and, and takes you all the way um, in a linear fashion to the end, um, which is exciting, is what we're often used to um, when we're growing up with, with fairy tales and, and the stories under the moonlight or whatever that we're told. It's, the stories will often take that form, but as you begin to explore um, other writers, some of the masters, you realize that you can actually piece a story together how you want. Um, what's critical is to ensure that you're keeping the pace going. So the pace is important to make sure it doesn't dip. Um, and there's enough in there to, um, for the reader to keep discovering. So it's kind of like, you know, how they describe people as onions. You keep peeling off each layer and they're discovering something new. So you've got to remember whichever form, um, however you decide to structure your narrative, that there's a sense of discovery at every single point. You're still able to have suspense you're still able to introduce new characters and tell stories within stories. So you might decide you're going to start at, um, like, let's say, um, at uh, four-fifths four to the end. Then you go back to the beginning, start one, two, three, four, and then you can do the very last bit last. I've read stories where they start at the very end. And then basically, like murder mystery stories often start like that, where they tell you what's happened, what the problem is. And then the actual narrative, the story, is discovering how the different characters um, actually got to that point in the first place. So the plot kind of gently unfolds. In a, in a different way. So it, it's really up to, to the writer to decide how they want to tell a story. I should say first that it depends what sort of story you are writing, what genre of fiction, if we're talking about fiction strictly. Um, so the, 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 it's always nice to have a, a surprise um, and a sense of suspense. It's, I was talking about discovery um, earlier. Um, it's always nice to, to kind of maintain that so the reader is exposed to something new. So the way I always look at stories, um, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. And you fit in little pieces, but there's still empty spaces. You don't have to complete it at the same time. You can keep on completing it as you progress, you know, through the story. Um, I, for, for I am just a big fan, I'm a big fan of um, John Steinbeck. Um, and one thing that he does, which I love, is foreshadowing. And what that means is that something might happen towards the beginning of the novel. Um, that's quite important and significant, but people might not necessarily understand why it's happening. So an example is, if you remember, Iafemi's son killed a war gecko in a very horrible, you know, senseless way, smeared the war gecko along the wall, he wasn't told off, and he wasn't really made to take responsibility for his actions. Now, later on in the novel, his mother is also involved in a meaningless, well, meaningful but senseless act where some other character is hurt. So that first event was like a signaling. It was giving the reader a sense of, almost like a sense of foreboding. Why is this happening? You know, why is this child murdering this animal? And then later on in the novel, somebody very closely related to that child carries out a very similar act. So 
You can throw little things in there if you like. You can drop clues. I love doing that with words and description. So for instance, um, you know, with Baba Segi, um, when he, I mean, this is a book about polygamy, so obviously there's going to be um, and an overwhelming um, presence of, of, of sexual intercourse. So when I'm describing how he has sex with his wives, um, I'm very careful um, about the adjectives that I choose. So I will use adjectives like hammering, and pummeling and knocking, you know, because I'm trying to make it clear that there's no tenderness in the act. Um, and that gives the reader, you know, one, a sense of what it must be um, to be one of his wives, but also, more importantly, his strength as a human being, as a character and perhaps the bumbling way in which he does things without necessarily thinking about the impact of his actions on other people or other characters. So that's, you know, something else that I, I, I will do. You know, you kind of, sometimes you can even, if you like, as an author, you can even mislead the reader, you know, into believing a certain thing when it turns out that it's actually the exact opposite. And how do you do that? It's the way that you kind of build the story. It's the blocks that you're putting one on top of the other. So the reader is reading it. I'm kind of building this structure in their mind. And then you can just take out one of the bottom blocks and say, uh, nah, I was taking you somewhere else. But you know, so it's, 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 um, being an author is a bit like being a witch, you know. You, you can be as, as, as manipulative um, as you want to and kind of really play with the people who are going to come in contact with your work. For spotting a unique story when you see one, um, you know, I told you that when I was 14, my, my brother's girlfriend told me this story. And as soon as I heard it, I knew that it was a story that I wanted to write. I just liked the way that um, she told it. And I loved the storyline. So I had like the skeleton of a story. So I now had to kind of fill in um, the other parts, create a beginning. You know, what happened before the story? what happened after the discovery, you know, and what happened in between. So, and that in itself is a very exciting process. But I think when you hear a story that's unique, and, and I should say also, I use the word unique um, deliberately, but also I'm not sure that it's the right word because I'm not even sure that there are any unique stories. Unique in the sense that nobody's written about it before, unique in the sense that nobody's told that story before, or it's a story that no one's actually ever heard of. Yes, there must be stories like that, but sometimes, you know, the retelling of a story within a different culture, cultural framework, within, um, against the backdrop of a totally different con continent, I think is something that I find quite attractive and, and you know, more interesting. Um, but also when you're talking about stories and the uniqueness of them, this continent, I don't think we've even touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's so much that's going on around us. And you know, sometimes um, I will say that it may not be the story that's necessarily unique. It could be the character. It could be the telling, the way that you tell the stories, the story. It could be the way that the plot, you decide you want the plot to unfold. So there's certain and different and multiple 
um, layers of uniqueness that can be employed by a writer. It's not necessarily just the story. Let me tell you how I do it. And this is not necessarily the right way, um, but it's what works for me. And I think it's partly from my training as a teacher. So when I, I start with a spider diagram, and that means you have a, a circle with the name of your character in the middle. And then you start drawing lines away from that circle. The different things that are unique perhaps to that character, how you want them to talk, how you want them to, to relate to other people. You can also do a mind map um, where you draw like it can be a stick man, right? And what you and you're, you very critical is what the character is thinking, you know, and what the character is saying and what the character is feeling. So sometimes when I get stuck, which doesn't happen very often um, because I'm propelled by a lot of adrenaline when I'm writing, but sometimes when I'm just trying to write a character, I will stop and do that. Okay, what is this character saying? What is the character really thinking? And what is the character feeling? And it's always interesting to me that those three elements are not always the same thing. And I think what that adds is the, it adds to the complexity of that character and makes them very human because that's exactly how we are as human beings. What we say is not necessarily what we're thinking. And what we're thinking, you're thinking one thing, oh, I wish I could do this. But what you're feeling is totally different. You actually may not want to, you may not feel like doing anything. So um, that is always kind of a, a pleasant surprise when you get to a certain point in your character development and you, you find that this is how that character operates. As a, as a writer, I must also say to you that I'm a very visual writer. Maybe because I initially wanted to write Baba Segi as a play, but I, I would see the scene play out in my head. I would see the characters interacting. Hear the way that they would converse with each other, the way they would look at each other. You know, I would, that scene would play out in my mind and then I would write it. I, I understand that that's not necessarily how other people write or how other people um, develop their characters, but that works very well for me.